Let's look at the order of calls in a recursive function. So we'll start by writing a new recursive function called cascade. So here's what I want cascade to do. Take in an integer n and print a cascade of the prefixes of n, which looks like this. If I start with 4, 3, 2, 1, I'll have it print out 4, 3, 2, 1, and then 4, 3, 2, and then 4, 3, and then 4, and then work its way back up mm -hmm. until we get back to the original n. Isn't that beautiful? So that's what we want, is to print out these different lines in a cascade. Let's first think about the base case. What would this cascade look like if I only passed in the number 5? It would look like 5. So we can start by writing down our base case. If n is less than 10, just print n. Otherwise, I need to draw the rest of the cascade. That's going to involve printing out the number that was passed in, drawing a cascade for everything but the last digit, and then printing out that number again. With this definition, if I ask Python to draw me a cascade for this big number, then I should see true beauty. And there is my cascade. Now let's understand how this works, because it's interesting that with so little code, I'm able to remember where I came from and work my way back up. Let's take a look at the environment diagram to understand what happened. So here we're going to define cascade just as I did, and then cascade on just one, two, three. So we pass one, two, three in. It's not the base case. So we're actually gonna execute all three of these lines of code. First we'll print. So we see the program output here shows that I printed one, two, three, and then I'll call cascade. Now this is gonna take some time to complete, but after it's finished, I'm still not done with this call to cascade. I'm still going to need to print again. So I call cascade on just 1, 2, which is 1, 2, 3 divided by 10. That's not a base case, and so we print out 12. And then we call cascade on the number 1. So 1 is a base case, so we'll just print out 1, and we'll return none because there's no return statement anywhere in cascade, so we return none. Now, we return none from here, and then we have to finish the call to cascade where n was 12, which means printing out n, which is currently bound to 12 in the current environment. So that's how I get the next 12 there. That call completes. I'm still not completed with the original call to cascade because I still have to print one, two, three, one more time. And then I'm finished. The program has terminated. Okay, so what happened there? Well, there was this critical moment where we had printed out one, two, three, one, two, one, and then we printed out one, two again. And that was because we had to finish executing the body of the function that we had called when n was 12. So each cascade frame that you see here is a different call to cascade. There's only one cascade function. But until the return value appears, that is, until the body of the function is completely executed, that call has not completed. There's more work to do, such as printing out the last 12 that we see down there. So any statement can appear before or after the recursive call in a recursive function. Here we print right before we cascade, and we print right after we cascade in order to get this nesting behavior. So the call before is there, the call after is there, and what happens? Well, that final call to cascade just printed one as the base case, and the previous call printed both the 12s, the one above and below, before and after the one. So by printing along the way, we can see exactly the order in which everything gets executed in this recursive call. 
Now there's another way to define cascade that's even shorter. So let's try that. Um, notice that in either case, the base case or the recursive case, I still print in. So I can print in just at the beginning. Now there's nothing left to do in the base case now. So why don't I get rid of this if else and just replace it with if n is greater than or equal to 10. So this means a check for the recursive case. Well then, I'll cascade and then print n again. So here's a shorter definition. Let's see if it still cascades like it did before. It certainly does. In either the base case or the recursive case, we print n. And then, if there's more work to do, which means n is greater than or equal to 10, we cascade and then we print n again. Okay, so we have two different definitions of cascade. One follows the structure that I told you about last time, where you start with the base case. If you're in the base case, you do whatever the simple thing is. Otherwise, you make the recursive call. And the other one avoids repetition by having one fewer print line and instead wrapping the recursive call in an if statement that detects for the recursive case. Now, both of these are reasonable things to do. And in general, I would say that if two implementations are equally clear, the shorter one is usually better. But in this case, I actually find the longer implementation to be more clear because it follows my thinking about what the recursive function does. If it's less than 10, we just print it out. Otherwise, we print the number cascade and print again. It's very easy to describe in that way and follows the structure of the computation. So when learning to write recursive functions, I would re recommend that you write it as you as I did on the left, where you put the base cases first and then think about the recursive cases. But it's up to you. Notice that both of these are both recursive functions, even though the, only the first one has the typical structure that I told you about. All you need to do to be a recursive function is call yourself, either directly or indirectly. 